Hi. Hello. Uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, effortless style. Um, it remains to be seen whether I can dispense with this information in a manner befitting the theme. Um, this is only my second talk ever in front of a live audience, apart from one weird occasion when I posed as a fake marketing company whilst at university. Um, and do I have a bogey on my face, but my flies aren't undone, so maybe this will all sort of work out. Um, by effortless style, I don't mean that I've invented like a uh, special application or task runner or preprocessor or something that's going to do all the coding part of uh, web design or CSS for you. Um, if I did, then we'd all be out of a job anyway, so that would be a bit uh, futile. Um, and also, that is a path I wouldn't want to go down because it is paved with broken glass, used heroin needles, and inaccessibility. <laughs> so, what I am going to talk about is how you could use um, uh, CSS in such a way, or set it up in such a way, that um, content editors or content contributors can actually um, do their work without having to think about presentation, without that becoming their job rather than yours. And this will mean unequivocally, irrevocably, and yes, really fucking unfortunately, that I'll be talking about HTML semantics. Um, but have you noticed, as I have, that uh, HTML and CSS, almost you could say there was almost like a relationship between the two, and uh, quite an intimate one, you might say. It's very difficult to write any sort of compelling CSS without any HTML to sort of adhere it to, you might say. Um, even Gareth here um, is aware of that, and he's fucking dead. So, <clears throat> although you can see he's quite keenly observant <laughs> if you follow the, uh, the uh, way his eyes are going there. Um, when I was seven, this is going to jump around a little bit, this is for context. When I was 17, I had a um, job working for my father, who is an electronic engineer of quite some note and certainly a lot more accomplished at his job than I am at mine. And uh, my summer job was to assemble these little units, which he... Um, which he designed himself, and I, basically I had to solder them together. And um, they're about this size. Now these got put into a much bigger unit, which looks like that. And that's my uh, father there, um, wearing protection. Although actually I think, if someone's watching this with a screen reader, I think the alt text should be wearing a hard hat. Um, but that big machine there, the small one which was made in his outhouse, in Norfolk, where I come from, just a short hop from here, uh, then became part of this. And then in turn, this unit or component, we like to talk about components in CSS, don't we? Um, became part of this big fuck off machine here, which is about the biggest machine. And it, in fact, is the biggest and most complex thing ever devised and built by humankind. I don't know if we compete at all with alien species or dolphins or whatever, but. That's the biggest we've, we've managed to uh, get away with. So what does the unit do? The unit is like an axiom. It's like a, what it does is it provides a reference measurement. So a number of the important processes which go, um, go on around CERN and the Large Hadron Collider depend on this little unit, which my dad asked me to help him assemble. <coughs> um, so you might say it's quite an important thing if, if, it, if it's this axiom which governs everything. Um, and you'd want, obviously, someone with a degree of responsibility and professionalism to do, you know, to do the donkey work. Now, <clears throat> oh. um, when I was 17, uh, I was a little bit listless, you might say. I wasn't really interested in things. I didn't really engage in things very much. Um, uh, frequently just couldn't be bothered, really. So that's um, one problem that might be uh, uh, considered. Uh, I like to drink as well. I discovered alcohol when I was around that age, and I was probably drinking some Two Dogs or Hooch or Mike's Hard Lemonade or something, whatever, Alco Pop children in the UK uh, drank at that time. Um, 
probably had a cigarette in one hand as well. So when you're soldering with one hand, that's really difficult because you have to hold the solder around the, um, the soldering iron. With it. And also, if I got a bit of smoke in my eye, I'd lose the depth perception. Um, <laughs> and even if all of these things weren't true, even if all of those things weren't true, I simply was shit at soldering. So <laughs> I didn't have any talent for it whatsoever. Um, so the first takeaway of my talk is this. CSS isn't that important. Um, if you uh, wake up at night in a cold sweat thinking, oh no, that website I did two years ago, that's got a selector chain in it which is just too, too fucking long. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to let this go. <laughs> at least what you haven't done is put a veritable time bomb inside a fucking large hadron collider, right? <laughs> so just think of me and, you know, and it won't matter about the select chain after all anyway, because when, because of my feckless uh, soldering, the whole universe collapses into an infinitely small dot of nothingness. It won't matter anyway. So, so now I'm trying to do a good job. There are two reasons for this. First of all, uh, and my job, by the way, is to um, design interfaces with HTML and CSS, um, but also um, I try to make things accessible. So I'm really big on um, way area, or whatever you like to call it. Um, so I'm trying to do a good job. First of all, I don't want to let my dad down anymore. But also, I think if I fucked up the Large Hadron Collider, and then I fucked up the World Wide Web, I think Tim Berners-Lee might ram raid my house again. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the important thing I learned was about axioms. And I think we talk a lot about components and dividing things up in CSS. Um, and not enough about um, the power of the cascade and how you can, you can start with tiny things and let things just sort of flow through. Um, this design principle offered by the W3C is a sort of an axiom, but more of a philosophical axiom. Um, and it says that HTML should allow separation of content and presentation. That's basically it. This is sort of CSS's uh, raison d'etre or telos. That is, this is why CSS exists. So... We started off with stuff like this, and it was bad. And we got rid of it, and it got deprecated. Um, you have the center tag there, is presentational markup. It doesn't describe meaning. It's got nothing to do with interoperability. It sort of just says, oh, it should look like this. We don't, we don't, it's not the realm that that should be in. So that got rid of. Same as attributes like face and color. Um, incidentally, the only place I can think of which still has a center tag is Google's search homepage. They actually use a center tag. Um, so this is good. Now, semantically um, speaking, they're, they're actually more or less the same. Because the, when I talk about semantics, it's not just to do with the purity or the, or the brevity of the code. It's really to do with how it communicates through the browser to different types of people. Both of those things are accessible, because both those lists will be announced through the accessibility API. Um, to assistive technology, so that's fine. But this is inaccessible in a different way, and I'll explain why. Um, it's not interoperable. So the pure form of just a list um, with simple list items can be written in simple HTML, which anyone can look up and see it specified. Um, this can have interfaces, standard interfaces provided onto it, like Markdown, which I really like using at the moment, and is um, experiencing a bit of a renaissance because of things like Jekyll and other um, static site generators. And also there's the ubiquitous button there, uh, which you'd press in a WYSIWYG editor, which would put you into a sort of a list mode. And then the CSS then simply is applied to all of those, of course, and away you go. Now. I want to talk about a persona now, um, if you're into your UX and everything. Um, this is Victoria. So if you'd like to imagine that Victoria is a very talented writer. She has a lot to say. She has a great vocabulary. She's very political and very um, sort of high impact with, uh, with her words. She's, she'd like to make a difference with communicating things. And the web is a really good medium for doing that, of course. Uh, she's web savvy, so she's not afraid of computers. She knows what a URL is and things like that. She'd probably have arguments with people about whether it's actually really a URI um, or whatever. Um, and <laughs> she's willing to learn new skills. So it would be fair to say that things like um, Markdown or even Markup 
are sort of an extension of what she already knows, which is writing in natural language. So she'd probably be quite interested in learning how to use Markdown if it would help um, in her line of work. Um, but what she does not want to be, what she wants to avoid being at all costs, is a designer. Um, she, it's not that she doesn't have any respect for designers, it's that it's just not what she's interested in doing. She's a writer, that's how she identifies herself, and any kind of design uh, concerns which encroach on her doing that would really upset her and, you know, bore her. So, this sort of markup is no good to her either. This is similarly bad to the, uh, the deprecated markup we looked up earlier, because um, the class is in there, and class is, is a presentational markup, and just like the old attributes is. Um, you can't create that form. Oh, by the way, that's BEM. I don't know if anyone uses BEM. That's block element modifier. It's sort of a CSS methodology. I take issue with the fact that it has element in its name because it's element agnostic. I think it's sort of protesting too much by having element in its name. I prefer, uh, or would have preferred, block unit modifier, but unfortunately that would be bum in that case. But never mind. Um, so anyway, she, ca she can't write without any sort of heavy configuration or advice or anything like that. It, she can't write that stuff with Markdown or Textile, which is a bit like Markdown but worse. Um, or, <laughs> or, um, or in a WYSIWYG editor. You could configure a WYSIWYG editor to write every list like that, but then what would be the point? Um, and also, it's not standard. It's, it's not a standard thing. This is, this is a highly opinionated way of writing uh, markup, so it's no good to her. The worst thing that could happen if we asked someone like Victoria to learn CSS methodologies is we'd be asking her to think in this sort of esoteric way that designers think. And if she starts thinking that way, and we ask her to act that way, inevitably she'll start writing that way. And what she would have been writing about was things of great sort of cultural gravitas and um, political import, but then she'll soon find herself reduced to writing things like why I hate iOS 7, how I came to terms with iOS 7, and according to the laws of entropy, of course, 50 best iOS 7 icon templates. Right, so Victoria mostly is going to be dealing with paragraphs, and it's really easy to give her a markdown file and say, put some paragraphs in here um, and you know, fill your boots, because you simply just have to leave a line between those two paragraphs. Um, those paragraphs can contain <coughs> revolutionary insight, and they're still the best thing about the web, being able to access paragraphs full of information like this, well-written paragraphs which inspire and incite, you know? Um, and it's a very easy way to write it like that. It doesn't impede on her. Um, but to designers, of course, there are lots of different ways that we can nuance the appearance of these. So, of course, this paragraph is just P. Um, P first child is like an expression which says if it's the first child and it's a paragraph, style it a certain way. So that's, um, that can um, sort of bring out an introductory paragraph or something like that. And already, Victoria is, would be seeing something which is sort of, by design, is nuanced, and by, by sort of uh, context based on selector, it is very nuanced. But we haven't asked her to prescribe that herself. We haven't asked her to be a designer. Um, this PP, or P plus B, whatever you want to call it, um, that has... Um, <laughs> sorry, that was poor, wasn't it? Um, with the adjacent sibling combinator, that's really handy if you're doing um, justified text because then to differentiate the two paragraphs, you'd want to indent every successive paragraph if the element which is before it is a paragraph. I use this quite a lot, and people don't like it because they say you mustn't use justified text. Um, but look at any Kindle. Um, you can concatenate um, pseudo classes like this. And we'll be talk I'll be talking about doing that in some very complex ways later. So you can do first child, first letter. So you can actually do that drop cap um, kind of effect, which is, you know, heralds the beginning of the prose. Um, and the cool thing about doing it using um, intelligent selectors this way is that we are not asking her to wrap that letter in a spam with a class of drop cap or something. If we told her that she had to do that all the time, every time she wrote, she not be happy at all. Um, so it'd sort of start to look something like this, but actually all she'd written were just blocks of 
and blocks of text. So she'd be happy. It looks good. People can read it and be compelled by it visually. Um, but she's, she's um, only had to do what she loves. Unfortunately, uh, paragraphs are not going to be the only thing. I say unfortunately. Unfortunately for us, we don't just have paragraphs to deal with. So we're going to have to try and anticipate dynamic content. And I don't think very much is, weirdly, not very much is talked about dynamic content and how to anticipate it on the behalf of our content contributors. So I'm going to try and talk about that a little bit now. So how would you approach um, selecting sort of generic elements? Well, we have got this uh, universal or wildcard selector. The problem with that, though, in this scenario, is that it's bollocks. Because, um, uh, let's say we wanted to separate every arbitrary element with a bit of spacing, which is sort of the, one of the first things I do when I normalize um, flow content. Um, what we get is um, what I call leftover glue. So this, um, it's colored like this in Firefox, but I think the colors are different in, in Chrome. So the yellow is margin and the uh, purple would be padding. So because we've said, just put, give every element some margin, um, the last element there, which isn't actually attached to anything, has margin as well. So you get this problem. So you have to try and develop something a bit more intelligent than that to deal with that. So this, um, which I call <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the bottomized owl selector. I can't believe I'm talking about this on this size of a screen, to be honest with you. But, uh, is a relationship selector. Um, I coined that phrase. It's not a very good phrase, don't use it, but it's a, uh, a relationship selector in the sense that it's not styling elements. It's not, it's, it's not as, um, as dumb as doing that. It's saying, well, when do we need the glue? We only need the glue when we have two things that we need to stick together. If you've only got one thing, then you're just going to stick your hand to it or whatever. So, um, so how would that work? So you're going to have the um, lobotomized owl selector with the margin top 1.5m. So let's say that 1.5 is your standard line height. Uh, so then, um, as you can see, only elements which follow elements have margin. And they can be any elements, of course. Um, so that sort of sorts that. But also it works infinitely through nesting. Um, because when you wrap the next element uh, you wrap an element around a number of those uh, elements, you still get the same interval. The problem is that uh, axioms mean inheritance. So we've done a sort of, that's, that selector's really quite powerful, or too powerful, really, for the context. Um, and it's going to get inherited by things like maps. And so you'll start getting maps where everything is about a kilometre or two kilometres uh, too far south, depending on the zoom level. Um, but the cool thing is that we don't have to care about that very much longer because we'll have web components which will come along and they will encapsulate little pockets of application functionality like maps and they'll say, we're not going to inherit uh, this uh, margin. You can tell them with special selectors to inherit the margin if you want to, but you can encapsulate it so that this wouldn't be an issue. This means that we can be very expressive with our flow content and anticipate dynamic content on, uh, on, on behalf of someone like Victoria. Um, but we can fuck about and do whatever we do inside our little application bits. Um, and also, the great thing about web components whilst we're on the subject is that they are themselves um, uh, exemplars of an easy piece of uh, markup to write. Um, so that would, that would unfold in the shadow DOM as something uh, much more complex. But Victoria, with a little bit of doc documentation, we said, well, if you want to put a map in there, find out what the coordinates are, stick them in the attribute on the X map element, or whatever. So again, it's making the editorial process easier. Now I'm going to, in 2014, at CSS Day, talk about CSS 2.1. Uh, uh, Massey has talked a bit about um, attribute selectors, and they're one of my favorite things. Uh, on their own, not that complicated. Um, but they are very well supported. And they do pertain to um, HTML semantics. Often we think of HTML semantics as just being the right element for the job, right? But actually, 
if you think about the type attribute on, say, input elements, the difference between um, type equals text and type, type equals um, checkbox is, it couldn't be more different. They render entirely differently. Their, um, their interaction is different. One's an on-off switch. The other one receives arbitrary text. And also, they're communicated to assistive technologies through the browser's accessibility API differently. They couldn't be more different without being different elements. Um, but the interesting thing you can do on Victoria's behalf is that you can combine those attribute selectors with pseudo content. So you can make an icon set like this one. So I'll take an example from that to explain what I mean. Uh, so let's say that there's a payment page. Um, we want to render that icon for the link. Let's imagine that's a link. Sorry, no underline. Always put underlines on links. I don't know why there isn't one there. Um, and um, we want to show that it's secure, but we don't want to have to ask Victoria to go in there and do it manually. So she would write some markdown. So that would be of this kind of form. So there'd be the square brackets would be the link text. And then the uh, normal brackets would be the link itself. And note that it starts with HTTPS at the beginning there. And that would get generated as HTML in the following. And of course, that HTTPS pattern carries through. Um, so it would be helpful um, to do this. We can use an attribute selector which starts with the hat equals, which means begin with, um, as I'm sure you know. Um, and then uh, concatenate some um, pseudo content like this and just render the private use area um, uh, icon of the little lock. What is less helpful, because it has to be authored, is the class. And almost all icon uh, font frameworks you see just give a list of classes. So that's extra documentation for Victoria, and it's a lot of uh, hassle. And it asks her to actually have to edit the code. So she can't do that in Markdown, can't do it in Textile, can't do it in any of those other interfaces, those more accessible interfaces for content editing. Here are some more examples. Uh, dollar equals PDF. Everyone wants to know uh, when a link goes to a PDF so that they don't follow that link, because it's a fucking pain in the ass, obviously. Um, uh, the starts with mail tool or the other protocols. That would be a really common one, which might crop up a lot. Uh, so you'd have maybe a little envelope would be rendered. Uh, and the start equals means contains. So anything which went to a Twitter resource, um, which contained twitter.com, would then render a Twitter bird, let's say. So uh, the great thing about this is the workflow that we can then get going. Um, so maybe um, and Victoria is comfortable with writing stuff in um, editorially. Um, she won't be anymore because it's not available, which is a sad because it's a really, really um, was a really nice uh, sort of ap application for writing sort of visual markdown. Um, but let's say a sort of visual markdown editor, which is a nice way for her to write. Um, this had a feature which allowed you to publish to WordPress. So she would do her work in editorially. We'd set it up so that her work got published to WordPress. And then in WordPress, we'd um, have the CSS waiting to take all of this text. And just simply by copying and pasting the link to that secure page, putting it in her markdown in the, in the first instance, we finally get this here. And she hasn't had to actually add that um, knowingly. Um, the really cool thing about it as well with this is that it's a dependable signifier. Um, by that, I mean that if that icon being rendered is attached to um, that attribute selector, which says if, it, if the um, href value starts with HTTPS, that means it will only appear if it goes to an HTTPS page. It's, I mean, it's up to you to make sure that that page is actually secure, but uh, um, it's no less dependable than uh, in a browser. So if you go to any HTTPS page in Firefox, you'll get the same icon. Um, with a class, you could put it on anything. You could put it on a non-interactive element, like a div. So a keyboard user couldn't even focus it to use it as a link anyway. Um, there are some um, difficult ones. If a content editor is um, writing some content and putting links in there, even links to their own site are likely to um, start with HTTP. So doing this external page thing, like you'd see in Wikipedia, would be uh, 
a bit flawed, because even links to the same pages on the same domain would, would start that way, and then you'd get that icon. So you could do something like this, um, where you have uh, the negation pseudo class. So what you're saying is like an expression. There is actually logic in CSS. Uh, and it would start would say, if it starts with HTTP colon, but it does not contain this um, substring of this domain or whatever the domain is, then it's safe to render the external link. Now, <clears throat> we've done elements, we've done element context, we've done attributes, and so far we haven't asked Victoria to do anything but write content. And that's why I love CSS, that you, it's powerful and allows you, it, it's sort of, um, if you use it in that way, it makes the editorial process accessible. There is something you can do just with text, without any, uh, any classes or anything like that. So let's say um, that uh, H2s in our, um, in our website should be rendered like this. Um, oh, sorry, she would write them like this, so the hash hash, if you're not familiar with, I mean, that's one flavor of Markdown, means um, H2. And then in our CSS, we want H2s to be rendered in this font, Bevan, which is the sort of the blocky, robust thing. But actually, we'd, we'd prefer it like kind of a fancy ampersand. That's Lobster 2, incidentally. But what we don't want to ask her to do is to ditch Markdown and write HTML and have to wrap the ampersand in a span with a class of ampersand on it. That would be fucking interminable, and she really wouldn't be interested in doing that, just because we've got this sort of weird ampersand fetish that we want to um, uh, exercise in our own design. I mean, it is nice to have nuance, though. It's just there's no point having nuance if it's that much work for someone. So there is a way to do this. Um, if you use Google Web Fonts, um, you can pull in a font like we have here at Bevan. Um, uh, just as it is, it's probably a good idea to try and subset it a bit. But you do have this text parameter. So what we're doing here is we're using at import to collect Bevan. And then we're using at import to collect lobster2. But we've got the text parameter of the uh, percent %26, which is just a URL encoding of an ampersand. So that uh, font that's then delivered to us is actually just a subsetted font which only contains the one character of the ampersand. And what that means, uh, sorry, this, this at the top here is, will be, if you look in the dev tools, you'll see like a, it'll have a, a sort of base64 encoded sort of name or something for this generated font. It really is its own font, so it's much smaller apart from anything else, so it's really good for performance. And, you know, it's really not as, fun to do little nuances like this if it's going to slow everything down. If you're getting, I mean, that might be the difference between a 200k font and, uh, and a 2k font. So this is our 2k font, one character font. And then in the CSS, you just use your font stack. So what we're saying is render lobster for everything that lobster is able to render, which in this case is just an ampersand, and then fall back for everything else on Bevan. You probably want to fall back further to like a, a sans serif or, or whatever in case you're... Um, in case your web fonts fail. Um, there is a code pen demo for this as well if you want to mess about with it. But that does, that does work, and it's efficient as well, which is nice. Um, so we've covered elements, element context, attributes, uh, text, actual text. The last thing is grids. And we talk, we've been talking about grid systems and layout a lot um, today, obviously. Um, and I want to say a little bit about it myself. Um, I don't think a system is a true system unless it's self-governing. So when we talk about grid systems, we're really talking about things that only people who have um, quite, a, quite a good knowledge in, um, well, laying out loads of nested divs, really, um, with classes on. Um, but what if we could do that without any classes at all, and it can be self-correcting? So, um, we're going out in a sort of a, more of a map macrocosmic level. Ultimately, um, let's say that um, Victoria is working on a blog. She's going to be creating um, article after article. This would be like maybe a little interface for a content management system. And as she creates them, we want to uh, feature them on her 
homepage, but we'll feature them in a grid and we'll just show the introductions. We'll truncate each, and then you'd have to click to go to the permalink. So it's sort of fairly standard fare with like a WordPress theme, I guess. Um, they'll look something more like that, um, but they'll all float um, in this case. Um, they could be inline blocks or something, um, but in this case, it'll be old school. But the markup that we're going to look at is going to be like this. It's just going to be pure markup. There's no classes, no presentational stuff in there at all. But we want that grid to actually um, uh, sort of make sure that it doesn't lose its aesthetic quality. I forgot I put that in there, because if you've seen the film, he goes, we all float, Georgie. And uh, yeah, I'm actually petrified of that. Um, right, so, <laughs> so this is a free by free grid. Uh, and let's say it, it, it's paginated, but it'll, it'll show um, up to nine at a time. So when we get into this problem here, where there's only seven articles, it starts to look a bit, well, shit. Um, one way of solving this would be to get on the phone with Victoria and have a word with her. So, hello? Yep, hello, this is Hayden from your design team. Oh, how many Haydens do you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a problem with the site at the moment. Yeah, it's looking a bit uneven. I wondered if you could help out with that. Yeah, could you write two more articles? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why two? Oh, uh, well, there's, there's two gaps. What do you mean? What do I mean, gaps? Well, if you look on the front, it doesn't look right. Well, if you haven't got time... No, no, I'm not being, you know... If you haven't got time to do it, no, I'll, I'll just put some Laura Mipsum in there. <laughs> yeah, I'll do a couple of articles, but I'll make it Laura Mipsum. Yeah, sort of like Latin. Hello? Right, so that's not going to work. So what we have to do is try and get it to um, sort of do it by itself. So, we want to find out what that is and fix it. So we do know it's a last child. So we can go, that's your last child, fine, make it 100% width. Or if you're not happy with making it 100% width, you could um, maybe make it margin naught auto, bring it into the middle, something like Something which tidies it up a bit. The problem is... When you're in this situation, doing last child, it'll go like that, which is rubbish. Uh, so, we have to be more intelligent about that. We have to work out um, what the elements are which only appear in the left-hand column. That's the first thing we have to work out, because only they will be the last child, or the potential last child in that column. And to do that, we can use nth child. So in this case, nth child 3n plus 1 means every three starting with one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ad infinitum. So the, it could be any number of items and that would work, of course. It's a, it's a pattern. But that's not all we need. Of course, we also have to concatenate that with last child. So what we're then doing is saying, all of the items in the first column, identify them first, and then any one which um, happens to be the last child, then that's, that's like our key element. We know that then we're safe to style that 100% width. So what happens if we do get this situation? Um, you can do a similar sort of thing. You still identify the key element on the left. Oh, and by the way, this is what we'd want it to look like. So 50%, I think, would be fair compared to having the gap. Um, you do nth child 3n plus 1 to find um, the bottom. You're always trying to find the bottom left element first, because that's key. Um, and in this case, it's also nth last child 2. So it's the penultimate, uh, penultimate element. So that's all good. Um, <coughs> and then to start the one after it, you can simply um, uh, comma separate the two sectors and add and the other one. And just say, oh, and his mate, and the other one after that, uh, with the adjacent <coughs> sibling combinator. Uh, I wrote an article about that a while ago, and I wanted to talk about it because I'm not sure how, if I explained it well enough in the article. Um, but since then, I started thinking about, well, if I can do the next one after that last child in the three column grid, what if there's more columns? If I use the general sibling combinator, I could say that bottom left-hand one, and then all the other ones after them like that. So, 
Um, I started to study that, and I noticed there was a recurring theme. There'd always be this common, like, key number. So four items in the last row. So what we're looking at there is nth last child four. <laughs> and uh, nth last child four, um, all the other ones after nth last child four. So all the, all the ones next to it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the desired width we're going for would be to, I think, distribute it as quarters. So 25% each, which would be 100% divided by four. Similarly, if um, there's only three items left in this five-column grid, it will be three items in the last row, which means we'd want to target as our key element nth last child three, then nth last child three, the, its mates along the side. And that would be 100% divided by three to put them three in a row, like that. And in that article that I wrote called the uh, CSS and the Power of Tetris, or Tetris and the Power of CSS, I said, bollocks to SAS, because all of the really cool stuff you can do with CSS is actually in CSS, all of the actual stuff that actually happens. And of course, SAS is only a preprocessor. It's just an interface onto it. But then I thought, I'll use some SAS. And, uh, <laughs> um, because I thought that I could then generate all of these rules. And that's what I made. Uh, I'm going to try to explain it, but this is only like the second bit of SAS I've ever written because I don't really use SAS. Basically, it's a for loop. Um, I'm just going to have a little drink whilst you look at it, because I, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> um, well, basically, it, it, it iterates. You've got the key number is the number of columns, and that's configurable. That's all you need to configure. Then you have um, you use the iterator for, for that magic number we talked about. But anyway, that will create all of the necessary rules to do that. It never goes further back um, than any items on the last row, because that's, it only iterates the num for the number of times that there are columns. Um, so then this works for any number of columns and any number of items, without using any classes or any um, descriptive presentational stuff in your markup. You don't have to write any template logic, even, which is uh, a bit of a boon, because that can be a bit of a pain in the bum. Uh, so if there's three columns and there's eight items, it would look like this. If you changed, the, um, changed it to five columns and there's still eight items, it would distribute itself like this. <laughs> five columns and nine items, it would go like this. And all the time, it's just this clean markup. So everything I've talked about uh, today um, has been done using just standard elements and standard attributes and standard text, and we haven't breached at any point um, the separation of concerns. So, in other words, we've not used classes. And it's not that using classes would be another way of doing this. If we use classes, that necessarily would break it for someone like Victoria, who's not interested in having to learn to code just in order to get her point across. And that's why I really like CSS. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Well, we thought we might have been out of time. Now we have plenty of time. <laughs> Come on. So, um, the, let's start with the icons that you were talking mm. about, that kind of thing, using those uh, selectors to put icons in front of things. Um, there was a question about, uh, it said exactly, cool. <laughs> Is there a library where you already find, defined all these icons? Yes, yes, sorry, I should have mentioned that it's, it's a, um, an icon font I did a, a while ago. I think I mentioned it in that Smashing Magazine article you were talking about. Yes, um, you did. It's called Auticons, which has got a lot of grief because it sounds a bit like Autobots. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, so a lot of Transformers fans were unhappy, I guess, about that. But um, yeah, th that is available. It's on my website. Oh, if you just search Auticons it icon font, uh, like A-U-T-I-C-O-N-S. Um, and I think it might be on GitHub, but I can't remember if I put it on GitHub. If it's not, I'll put it there. If, and if you have any suggestions for, for icons to add to it after looking it up, 
then please tell me because that would be it would be cool to extend it if I find time. Okay, and would you would you style a, a static website that doesn't change very much at all in the same way that you discussed uh, using CSS here? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that. I'm not sure I understood the question. <laughs> <laughs> I figured yes, it's definitely. like the only other question, so I should. <laughs> Without a question, in a heartbeat. All right, so I'll ask no, you. No, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> what, what's the biggest pushback that you've had from people about um, using CSS instead of class? I'll show you. <laughs> this, is, this is one comment I got for talking about. Uh, so uh, I think a lot of people who are very um, wedded to their object oriented CSS. Uh, found a lot of the, these sorts of things that I've been saying highly offensive and took them very personally. So I, I've been called a troll. Um, that was another comment I got on the Smashing Magazine. Um, <laughs> it's like if you've written 4,000 words and then someone goes, you've demonstrated nothing. I mean, even if I must have demonstrated something, even if it was crap. But anyway, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, no, most people say that it's... Um, it's impossible to scale. You can't use this, these kinds of techniques on large projects and stuff like that. And originally, I did actually say, quite foolishly probably, just don't use classes ever for anything, which is highly unrealistic. Um, but um, I think things like BEM go too far the other way. Like, why prescribe everything so precisely like that? I don't know. If anyone knows, then please do tell me. I, I think that might. There's a possibility that some people might come yeah. up to you. And <laughs> yeah. And um, are, have you changed your mind about things like SAS? Uh, I had a lot of fun writing that, that one SAS for loop. I might write a couple more SAS for loops in the future. Um, I think it can, it can be a really, really handy tool when you want to generate a lot of... Um, you want to generate a, a lot of stuff which you don't want to really hand write. So when you, you start looking at things algorithmically, um, it becomes really interesting and really powerful. But what I don't understand is, is sometimes you get when you're generating lots of um, <coughs> generating uh, these for loops, which then create sort of iterated class names. Because then you've got to, I mean, that was really quick in the CSS, but then you need to go for all the markup and write each of these generated unique class names and everything. So I never quite understood that or why that would save time. You're just sort of shifting the, the, the amount of work from one realm to another, I guess. So one of the criticisms of um, what you've talked about, and uh, well, I pretty much talk about the same thing to people as well, is that uh, you get the scalable thing, but a lot of object-oriented CSS, like I guess the classic example of object-oriented CSS would be like H2 classes H2. Yeah. So that basically anything that has a class of H2 can look like an H2. Yeah, and y yeah, you really, I th I th sorry, I'll do interrupt. I think I know where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the problem there is that, um, in fact, the W3C warns us away from using classes too heavily because essentially you're creating your own document language, but it's not an interoperable document language. Um, classes can only define how things are presented. So class H2 only has a visual meaning, whereas H2 has an interoperable, accessible meaning. You can press 2 when you're using a screen reader, and it will take you to that heading. A class can't do that. It can't, it can't possibly do that. So the danger of using classes in that, I mean, you could put the class name of button on a div, and a keyboard user wouldn't even be able to focus that div. Uh, it could look like a button, but it won't behave like one. Um, so I think the rule of thumb is only style elements um, semantically based on how they probably should be presented, and um, turn off CSS, and if it still looks fairly usable, like the buttons actually look like buttons, even though they look like sort of ugly default buttons, then you're probably onto something, right? And what about cases where, for example, within an article that Victoria would write, um, there would have to be, uh, because someone wanted it that way, something that you would normally use, say, Flexbox for, which would actually require you to put a container around something. How do you deal with that type of thing where a container is necessary in order to apply the CSS that, that you're going to apply? Yeah, um, I think that's where web components would come in. Uh, there's been a lot of work by um, Steve Faulkner has is, is, is been experimenting with this a lot. I, I, did, I did one uh, web component recently for, it was like a detailed summary style pattern. 
And the idea is that you just have that one element and you put some information there and then it, it sort of extrapolates itself into being a, an accessible widget. And so um, I think, I don't know if it's the uh, Brick or one of, one of those frameworks has a, it has a whole tab interface thing as a web component. So you can write it in a really, uh, really concise way, like, like you'd write a short code in WordPress, which sort of opens up, doesn't it, and does all of the, the nitty gritty code inside. So I think hopefully web components will solve a lot of that. Yeah. There's been, um, we heard a little, some about performance today, and a lot of people talk about selector performance, mm. um, whether or not we feel it's negligible. Uh, the lobotomized owl selector, do you know anything about performance related to that? Uh, it will be slower than some selectors, but the, the thing about selector performance is that um, you're sort of comparing a fox, which has had like a nice meal and a sleep, with a fox which is sort of a bit depressed and a bit out of breath. Um, because there's really not practically much difference. And coming the other way will be like an elephant called JPEG, and that will just crush them all anyway. And um, I think uh, <laughs> Ben, sorry, Ben, ben Frame, I think, um, Steve Souders in, in uh, 2009 did a very comprehensive study on select performance, and the, the result of his inquiries were, was to sort of go, uh, because it really, it really didn't, it didn't make much difference. He had to go out of his way to make the most ridiculous selectors across like thousands of DOM nodes. And by doing that, I think he increased, increased the page load time um, by like a couple of milliseconds or something. But then more recently, um, Ben Frame did a study and his conclusion ultimately was, although there is a difference in performance between selectors, his conclusion was that it's the number of selectors, predictably, which, which will affect performance more so than the types of selectors. However, I probably, there probably is a legitimate relationship to worry about between the types of selectors you use um, when it involves animations and repaints. Because I think if you use a lot of attribute selectors or chain selectors to do that, I think that would start to actually affect it. And something like an ID or a class would probably be better in that. In that in those sorts of scenarios, yeah. We have a subject for our discussion later on. Um, <laughs> so, of course. Right? <laughs> so um, I've heard one of the arguments uh, against this and for class-based frameworks is um, that refactoring CSS is so hard, especially for mm. big sites, you know, because obviously this kind of thing doesn't work for big websites. Right? Um, I think that the, this this kind of stuff that helps Victoria specifically does help. If it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a sort of a syndication site, then it means that her writing content's easier. But, but taking classes out of the sort of the actual sort of masonry code, the actual like grid layout or whatever, then uh, yeah, that's probably a bit unrealistic, especially if you're moving components and things around. Um, so. Yeah, I, it, it, like anything else, I, I suppose it depends in what, what context you're, you're using and, how you're, and who you're trying to help. But it basically it. comes down to refactoring CSS <laughs> oh, sorry, or refactoring yeah. structure. I didn't really answer the question, yes. did I? Um, no, the, well, you did, kind of. <laughs> sort of. No, but re refactoring, yeah. Refactoring is a problem for developers, but accessibility is a problem for users. And so my, I, I suppose both are problems, but um, start off with semantic HTML. Um, when that starts to get unmanageable, use a class on a, on a module container and attach styles to that, maybe. Uh, but yeah, there's a happy medium between the two, I think. But, but it's important to have things accessible. So if you get a CSS framework, it's all about CSS. It's not about HTML, because you can't ship a CSS product if it's contaminated with HTML, I guess. But then you have pattern libraries where you have both, and that's why pattern libraries are sort of, they're the successors, I think, because you actually get the HTML, um, perhaps even like the, the ARIA attributes for added accessibility and the styling all tied together. And whether they come as web components or, or standard markup, but enhance in that way. I think that's better. To treat CSS as its own thing, I think is a dangerous thing to do. Okay. Thank you very much, Hayden. Cheers.